Hi everybody and welcome to today's video on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Today we're going to talk about both the hypothalamus and the pituitary, breaking the pituitary gland down into its two main constituent parts, and then we're also going to briefly touch on the pineal gland. So let's go ahead and begin by talking more generally about the key structures at play here, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. If you recall, the hypothalamus is part of the limbic system in the nervous system. It's a more centralized set of structures in the brain with the hypothalamus existing right in here as we have zoomed in by our visual. And the hypothalamus has some very important roles, both related to the overall function of the nervous system as well as in relation to the endocrine system. So let's go ahead and start breaking down some of those. First of all, in terms of the endocrine system, the hypothalamus is going to be charged with the production and secretion of some very key hormones. And we'll see as we move along through this video how the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland coordinate activity to make this production and secretion as effective as possible. From there, the hypothalamus is going to be charged more broadly with the coordination of the body's internal environment and maintenance of homeostasis. Now moving on to the pituitary gland, also referred to as the hypophysis, this is an extension off of the hypothalamus and it actually can be broken down into two main parts as we'll see, the anterior and posterior pituitary gland, each formed of different materials. One, as we'll come to see, is composed of neural tissue and the other is composed of glandular tissue, with this differentiation and composition providing a wonderful degree of separation of responsibility. And we can see it in the visual, but we might as well go ahead and clarify that the pituitary gland in terms of geographic location in the brain rests just below the hypothalamus. So let's go ahead and begin by talking about the posterior pituitary, which is also referred to as the neurohypophysis. The reason it's known as the neurohypophysis is because the posterior pituitary gland is going to be the subset of the pituitary gland that is composed of neuronal tissue rather than glandular tissue. And so as a result, the posterior pituitary gland is a direct neural extension from the hypothalamus. And this structural relationship is actually very much tied to the function of the posterior pituitary gland. As we mentioned in the last slide, the hypothalamus is responsible for the release and production of certain hormones. When we're talking about the posterior pituitary gland, we're talking about a structure that's going to store some of these hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus, and then it will go on to be the structure that actually is responsible for releasing these hormones. So an important thing to remember then, as we move along, is that the posterior pituitary gland is not producing its own hormones. It's receiving hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus, and it is responsible for releasing those. And the two key hormones that we're going to talk about, made in the hypothalamus, released by the posterior pituitary, are antidiuretic hormone, otherwise known as ADH, and oxytocin. So first, we're going to go ahead and discuss antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, also known as vasopressin. Now, if you recall the chapter on the excretory system, the functional unit of the kidney is something known as a nephron. And it's this whole convoluted structure, as we can see in this visual to the right, with each different part of the structure having different functions in reabsorption and minerals and ions and water and all these different things. But the structure in particular that we're going to be focusing on for our purposes is the final one the collecting duct. The collecting duct is involved in reabsorption of water via structures known as aquaporins water channels. And what antidiuretic hormone is going to do for us is it's actually going to allow us to increase the amount of water reabsorption that the nephron is capable by increasing the overall number of these water channels, these aquaporins. And this is wonderful for us because we are now going to have a higher capacity for water retention and reabsorb more water back into the blood. And yes, of course, antidiuretic hormone is an antidiuretic. Now, why does this make sense? Not even speaking on the fact that antidiuretic is present in the name. Let's more so think about the function. The prefix anti is something that we're probably pretty familiar with. And in this context, we can think of it as referring to something preventative. And the suffix is probably more familiar than you might think. The suffix in this case is diuretic. It sounds like the word diarrhea, an affliction that unfortunately I'm sure many of us are very familiar with. So without getting too in-depth, let's start to think about how these two words, diuretic and diarrhea, might give us the ability to unpack what an antidiuretic hormone would do. The thing that's going to give us this answer and tie both together is the presence or absence of water. If an excretory deposit were to be made by a human that contains a large volume of water, this is something that we can immediately recognize as potentially synonymous with a diarrhea-like scenario. But let's dig a little bit deeper into that. What would it mean if the excretory product had a large volume of water? It means that we're not retaining water efficiently or at a high level. So then what do we have with antidiuretics? 
When antidiuretics are present, we should expect the opposite scenario to occur. We should expect an excretory product with a low water content. And we know that this is what antidiuretic hormone does because we already know that it increases the number of aquaporin channels and helps us reabsorb water in the collecting duct of the nephron of the kidney. Next, we have the hormone oxytocin. And there are two main functions that we should talk about. First of all, we're going to target the uterus to stimulate uterine contractions during child labor. Next, oxytocin is also going to target the mammary glands separately from the uterus, stimulating the release of milk during breastfeeding. Now, what makes oxytocin such an efficient means of achieving both of these is that the way it operates in both cases is via a positive feedback loop. And we have actually an example on the bottom right of your screen. So before we dive into it, let's just imagine that over here we have the hypothalamus. It's producing oxytocin. It gives it to the posterior pituitary gland. And now we're actually releasing oxytocin into the environment. In this case, we're talking about stimulating contractions during childbirth. So here is our contraction indicator. And the way that this is going to work is that the contractions actually serve as the positive indicator for the production of more oxytocin. So more oxytocin equals more contractions, more contractions equals more oxytocin, which is clearly a very beneficial setup when you're trying to deliver a live child. All right, so that was the posterior pituitary gland. It's time to go ahead and move on to the anterior pituitary gland, also known as as the adenohypophysis. Adenohypophysis, of course, being because the prefix here, adeno, is in reference to glands, and the anterior pituitary gland is, of course, constructed of glandular tissue this time rather than neural tissue. And the most important thing about the anterior pituitary gland, the thing that distinctly separates it from the posterior, is that it's going to go ahead and produce its own hormones, a function that is made possible by the glandular tissue composition. But saying this does not mean that it's completely distinct from the hypothalamus in terms of function. It still relies on the hypothalamus to be stimulated and release the hormones that it produces itself. And so we actually have two separate categories of hormones that the hypothalamus is capable of releasing in order to stimulate the anterior pituitary gland one way or the other. The first is known as hypothalamic releasing hormones. If one of these hormones is to reach the anterior pituitary gland and stimulate it, we're going to release the hormones that the anterior pituitary gland generated. Hypothalamic inhibiting hormones, on the other hand, are the exact opposite. If one of these hormones were to reach the anterior pituitary gland from the hypothalamus, the result would be the inhibition of release of the hormones produced by the anterior pituitary gland. There is, however, one more key detail that we need to discuss. In the case of the posterior pituitary gland, the mode of transfer of hormones from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary was relatively straightforward. Both were composed of neural tissue with the posterior pituitary gland serving as the direct extension of the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary gland does not have that luxury, so instead we're going to count on something known as the hypophyseal portal system. Because if we can't rely on a direct connection between these two structures, what we're going to need to do is pass the stimulating hormones from the hypothalamus into the bloodstream and send those down to the anterior pituitary. Using our regular artery and vein system would see these hormones traveling throughout the body, passing through the heart and back up to the brain just to reach the anterior pituitary gland, which geographically is located right next to the hypothalamus. Lucky for us, our body is more crafty than that, and we're going to utilize portal veins, which are very aptly named because they serve sort of as a portal from one part in the circulatory system to the other, bypassing the rest of the circulatory pathway. And so this is an extremely efficient means of connecting the anterior pituitary to the hypothalamus, despite the fact that one is not the direct neural extension of the other like we have in the case of the posterior pituitary. And so without further ado, I present to you the stimulating hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus pass through those portal veins and target the anterior pituitary gland. The first goes by the shorthand GNRH. The long form is gonadotropin releasing hormone. And once it reaches the anterior pituitary and goes ahead and stimulates it, it will cause the release of two hormones, luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone known as FSH. The next is TRH or thyrotropin releasing hormone. When it interacts with the anterior pituitary causes the release of something called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. We also have CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. And once this reaches the anterior pituitary gland, it's going to cause the release of adrenocorticotropic 
hormone or ACTH. And last but not least, we have GRH, known as growth hormone releasing hormone, which appropriately enough, when it finally reaches the anterior pituitary gland, will cause the release of growth hormone or GH. All right, so we've completed phase one when it comes to the anterior pituitary gland. We've released those hormones from the hypothalamus and they finally reach the anterior pituitary, stimulating the release of its own hormones. There's actually two kinds of hormones though that are produced and released by the anterior pituitary gland. The first is known as tropic hormones. And these are gonna seek to quote unquote, keep the ball rolling because tropic hormones target other endocrine glands with the goal of promoting further hormone release, with the goal of causing those endocrine glands to release their own hormones. Direct hormones, in comparison, take a little bit of a different approach. Rather than targeting endocrine glands and trying to stimulate the release of more hormones, they're just going to go right to the organs and try and cause some effects themselves. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering what's going on with this sad pig over here that seems to be crushed by all of his schoolwork. Well, actually, what's going on here is a very important mnemonic, flat pig. And I just want you to keep in mind flat pig as we move along. It'll make a lot of sense later. Let's kick things off with a couple of tropic hormones. The first that we're going to discuss is FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, which actually has two separate functions, one in females and one in males. In females, it's going to stimulate the growth of the follicle. And in males, it's going to go ahead and mature sperm. Another important anterior pituitary gland tropic hormone is LH or luteinizing hormone, which stimulates many different things. It's going to stimulate ovulation, the formation of the corpus luteum in females, and the production of testosterone in male gonads. Now, there are actually a couple of kind of silly ways that you can remember both of these separate from the flat pig example that we were talking about before. FSH kind of looks like the word fish, you know, if you were to swap out the letter I in fish for just nothing. And fish, as we all know, swim. So does sperm. So if you're looking for a little trick to remember what FSH does, you can remember that FSH sounds like fish. Fish swim, it matures sperm. Sperm swim as well. There's also one for LH, luteinizing hormone. If you want, you can use LH as an acronym for large and hairy. Two adjectives that would become more pronounced with more release of testosterone. And in the visual example down below, you can see how these tropic hormones are really pushing for the release of other hormones rather than going ahead and causing these effects themselves. Here in the middle, we have the anterior pituitary releasing luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. On the left, we have a very simplified pathway for males where we're targeting the testes and the release of a different hormone, testosterone. And on the right, we have an equally simplified pathway for females where we're targeting the ovaries and the release of estrogen and progesterone. Another tropic hormone released by the anterior pituitary gland is ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH, once released, will go ahead and affect the adrenal gland and it will cause the adrenal gland to release glucocorticoids, which are very important because they allow us to do a little stress combating. They are also going to go ahead and increase the glucose levels in the body. And the final tropic hormone that we're going to go ahead and discuss is TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. And appropriately enough, TSH is going to go ahead and stimulate the thyroid gland to release some hormones and the names of those hormones are T3 and T4 with the eventual goal with T3 and T4 of increasing metabolism. And so in our example to the right we can see just how this cascade takes place. We begin in the hypothalamus with TRH or thyrotropin releasing hormone which will stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to release TSH in this example, or thyroid stimulating hormone. And instead of causing an effect on its own, it's gonna stimulate another endocrine gland, which we'll actually discuss in a later video, the thyroid gland, to release its own hormones, known as T3 and T4, and eventually will start to work towards that goal of increasing metabolism. Now, how about the direct hormones from the anterior pituitary gland, the ones that are actually gonna go right to the organs and try and cause some changes themselves? The first is known as prolactin. Prolactin is, in fact, gonna go ahead and stimulate the mammary glands and increase the production of milk. Now, this is going to sound familiar. It's going to sound very similar to oxytocin, but there's some very finite differences between the two. Prolactin, first of all, increases milk production. Oxytocin stimulates the release of milk. Second of all, prolactin shows up following childbirth and does not occur 
in a positive feedback loop scenario. Oxytocin shows up during breastfeeding when release of milk is necessary and does operate in a positive feedback loop. The other direct hormone released by the anterior pituitary is known as growth hormone otherwise known as somatotropin. Now you can probably guess the function of growth hormone. We're going to be targeting body cells and looking to grow and divide those body cells. And it's finally time to return to our good friend, the flat pig, and get an explanation on why it's so important. Now that we've seen all of the tropic and direct hormones, it should start to make a little bit more sense. Flat is a mnemonic for all of the tropic hormones, and pig is a mnemonic for all of the direct hormones. And looking throughout the list, we can confirm that, yes, of course, this is the case with FSH, LH, ACTH, and TH all being tropic hormones of the anterior pituitary, and prolactin and growth hormone or somatotropin being direct hormones. And then I is just kind of thrown in there as a place filler to make the mnemonic sound a little bit better, so don't worry too much about I. And so as always, it's very good to keep the broader perspective in mind as you're working through some of these more narrow pathways. And so here's a visual that ties together all of the hormones released by both the anterior and posterior pituitary and relating it to the original release of hormones by the hypothalamus that kicks off everything. This way you can really appreciate the different pathways that are possible. We can go the route of the anterior pituitary and stimulate it to release its own hormones, which we've talked about. We have over here the tropic hormones, and on the right here, the direct hormones, which go right on to affect organs, while the tropic hormones seek to affect other endocrine glands. We can also go the direct neural connection route, focusing on the posterior pituitary, which will house hormones produced by the hypothalamus, which we can see here that only have direct functions. And one more quick note that we do have for you today is about the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is very important because it produces something that might sound very familiar. It produces melatonin, with melatonin, of course, being an incredibly important hormone for regulating your circadian rhythm in sleep patterns. All right, let's go ahead and do a mini quiz and see what you've learned. Which of the following hormones causes the release of milk during breastfeeding once released? Read this question carefully. Go ahead and pause the video now. Take a minute and answer this question. The correct answer is B for oxytocin. Remember, oxytocin is one of those hormones released by the posterior pituitary and acts in a positive feedback loop. More breastfeeding equals more oxytocin. More oxytocin means more release of milk, which encourages more breastfeeding. More breastfeeding encourages more release of oxytocin and so on. A, prolactin is incorrect because this is a hormone released by the anterior pituitary that stimulates the production of milk, not the release. And it also occurs following childbirth and does not act in a positive feedback loop. It's not going to be C, follicle stimulating hormone. Remember, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, is more so associated with the development of the follicle in females and sperm maturation in males. And luteinizing hormone is also incorrect. Remember, this is a tropic hormone, which down the line is going to seek to cause things like ovulation and the release of testosterone. All right, this has been the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. I hope you took something away from this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. But if not, happy studying.